Thank you for taking the time to view this message online. You can connect with us more through our comments section of this video, through our Facebook page, or through our website, nhgj.org. Have you ever been in a stuck place where you feel like you need a different perspective in order to be able to move forward? A fresh set of eyes or maybe another voice to bring clarity to the situation that you're in. You've looked at your situation over and over and you just can't seem to find peace and, and resolution to what it is that you're looking at. So what do you do? You might read a book or an article. You might find somebody who's doing a podcast on that subject and listen, see if you can get some insights. Oftentimes we invite another voice into our circumstance so that we can get that fresh perspective. We tell a family member, a friend, a coworker, really anyone who will listen so that they can give us a fresh set of eyes to our dilemma. Sometimes this is really helpful, having this counsel from another come to us. A friend that brings that perspective that makes all the difference for us. But what happens when, if instead of good counsel, this individual gives you really bad counsel? Or worse yet, what if instead of just bad counsel, this individual brings accusations and piles onto the situation in such a way that he or she is just making it worse. They speak hurtful comments at you. Uh, they tell you that it's your fault. If you weren't so arrogant or uh, so uh, misguided, this situation wouldn't have happened to you in the first place. All of a sudden, you're stuck with your original problem that you felt stuck with in the first place, and now you're dealing with the burden of feeling abandoned, alone, accused in the midst of all of this. And then if you want to really add insult to injury, add on top of this, you present your difficulty before God and it feels like he, he's silent, he's quiet. You're not hearing any answer at all. You pray, you fast, you cry out, silent. It's this very experience surreal as it may seem, is this very experience that we look at the book of Job in today's message, and it's the experience that Job had. In this next series of messages over the next couple of weeks that I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to present you with some of the ways that we come to conclusions in our life, how we see things, the perspective we gain in our life, and we oftentimes invite people, much like Job invited his friends, or whether he invited them or not, his friends had opinions and ideas about why Job was in the circumstance he was in. And so we're going to look at their perspective and the counsel that he received, because it's a very common way that we as humans look at our circumstances and why we go through troubles. And then in the end, we're going to be able to see God's perspective of Job's situation and hear God's counsel on the matter. So if you would, I invite you to join with me in prayer as we prepare to look at the book of Job. And then later on at the end of this message, uh, I'll lead us in a time of communion together. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to be the teacher. You're so very good at it, of opening up our eyes to what you have to say to us. And so we surrender ourselves before you and we ask you to lead us, to guide our thinking, to guide our affections as we open the word for this study. We thank you for the examples you give us in scripture that show us the true pathway forward with you and through our lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Job is a book of wisdom. Uh, it is joining with Proverbs and Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament to give us biblical perspective of wisdom. And it's located right after Esther and right before the Psalms, if you're going to be looking for it in your Bible or if you have a Bible app that you're going to follow along with. Now, we get most of our information, limited as it might be, about Job right in the first chapter. So, we don't have a lot of background about who Job is, but we do see a description, an ever so brief description about who he is and where he's at 
uh, during this opening chapter, Job chapter 1. Join with me in looking at the scripture together. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one of his, on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now, just in this brief few verses, there are a number of things that we just are drawn into the story right away about Job. And the author, though unknown, uh, wants us to understand or see about Job. Uh, one, he's not an Israelite, but he's a man from a faraway place called Uz. And the author begins the story about Job by setting us up with some pretty strong feelings that this author wants us to feel about Job. One of the first things that is highlighted is that Job is blameless and upright. This is really a significant statement about a man, a human being. All throughout the Old Testament, we see people who may be blameless, but then there's a flaw that's pointed out about the individual. And this author, as he points to Job, he says, Job is a really good dude. In fact, he's so good that he offers sacrifices for his kids for unknown sins that quite possibly they have sinned in some way. And I want to make sure, Job says, that those sins are covered. So I'm going to offer sacrifices on behalf of my children. And it says that he does this continually. So right away, what we're supposed to understand about Job is he is a righteous guy, that he follows God. He has the right type of heart. The next thing is that we're supposed to understand that Job is blessed he is blessed with family, which is the, one of the greatest of all blessings that he could have. Seven sons. And of course, in, in Hebrew scriptures, the number seven is always significant. It's the sign of kind of perfection. It's, it's the God number. It uh, has totality or completeness to it. And so we're pointed to this uh, description about Job's, uh, Job's family that he's got seven sons and he's got three daughters. So he's abundantly blessed with sons and daughters as well. Third, we see Job is blessed with wealth. Oh my goodness, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, five yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very, very many servants that we're told. The blessing is upon Job. And then fourth, out of just a small portion of uh, the opening part of Job, Job is revered. It says that he is the greatest of all the people in the East. And so you look at Job and you get this feeling that what the author wants you to know is that Job is hashtag blessed. Job is righteous. Job has the life that any God-fearing person would want. It is such a, such a blessed life that it's just supposed to blow your mind away that, that you want Job to have this because he's such a good dude. He's such, such a righteous man before God that, that's not feelings of jealousy or, or uh, mismanage, you know, uh, sense of injustice. No, you, you want to cheer for Job and you're thankful that he has all these blessings. That's really the feeling that this first part of Job evokes out of us is that Job is a blessed man of God and he's the type of person that any one of us would want to be. He's done the right things and so he's experiencing God's blessings because of that. So now that we're emotionally invested into and cheering for Job, we're in a setup. We have been set up in just these opening verses to really be invested and excited for Job in his life. It is God who is just and righteous, and it is God that is going to allow Job to experience incredible pain. 
In verses 6 through 12, there's a heavenly conversation that takes place between a character named Satan and God. Satan says to God that Job is not truly righteous. He just knows how to play the game. In other words, he's your puppet. Satan, the accuser, is in this heavenly conversation before God, and he says, Job is not a righteous man. Job, God, Job is your puppet. And the only reason he does the righteous thing is because you bless him. And therefore, if Job wasn't blessed and you removed your hand of blessing off of him, Job would not be righteous at all. In fact, he would curse you and he would be like so many other humans on the earth. You reward him so he keeps doing right things so he can get more from you. In other words, what Satan is saying is Job has you figured out, God. He's not righteous, but if you let calamity come on him, he's as fickle as all others and he's going to turn away from you. But here's God's reply. In Job 1.12, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand, Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now this is dramatic effect. We've just, we've we've got our eyes on Job, we're excited for him. And now all of a sudden in this conversation, we realize Job, his blessings, his family, everything is at risk except his physical well-being at this point. We'll get to that in just a moment. But Job's life is very vulnerable at this point because we've been included in this discussion that God is going to withdraw his covering, his protection away from Job and allow calamity to come upon his life through Satan. And so we pick up the story in Job 1, 13 through 20. Job is enjoying all the blessings of his life and Satan is going to stretch his hand over his belongings, and his family. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck them down, struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness, struck down the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people. And they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And it's just like that. In just one fail swoop, one blink of the eye, all of Job's possessions and his sons and his daughters are gone. Tragedy has struck. The smile that you had on your face for Job, the way that you were celebrating his life and his character and the blessings is replaced with this feeling of dread that just sits in your stomach like a weight, a sinking weight over Job's life. It's in ruin. It's total chaos. Material wealth gone. Children gone and dead. The joy that Job had has been replaced with anguish. Job 1, 20 and 22 through 22, it says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Now that would be enough, wouldn't it? All the wealth gone, more than that. All of his children gone. The grief overwhelming, it says that he tore his robe, he shaved his head, just a sign of dishonor, of lowliness. 
he falls on the ground groveling and he worships God. He pours his heart out to God. That would be enough. What Job has gone through to this point would be enough to wreck so many people's faith. Their possessions, their family, distraught over it all as it's been destroyed before him and taken, stripped away from him, taken from him. But Job holds on to his trust in God. So we're taken to another level. Job has held on to his faith. It says he worships God and he does not sin against God. But if you remember, God instructed Satan. He says, listen, you can't put your hand upon Job. You can't bring physical calamity upon his body. But now that changes. Satan shows up before God again, and we hear this conversation where Satan says that God is only worshipped for his blessings, and God brings Job's name back to the forefront. If I'm Job, I'm saying, God, please don't bring my name up before Satan anymore. But God says, have you considered my servant Job? In all of the calamity that he's experienced, he still is faithful to me. But Satan says, it's not just because of the blessings, it's because you protect him. God says in Job 2, 3 through 10, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? A blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. All that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. We look at this first two opening chapters and it's overwhelming to our soul if we look at it in light of uh, Job's life and what he's gone through. Losing all of his material goods and children was enough to think that Job might walk away from God. That might be too much for him to bear. He may just say enough is enough and renounce his dependence and his worship of God. So we took a breather thinking, okay, good. Job made it through that. In all of that first losing his possessions and his children, he did not sin. Good. Job can continue on peacefully with his life. But now we see Job inflicted with pain in his body from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head, sores from head to toe, unrelenting, He's scraping them is the image that's written out for us. He's sitting in a pile of ash, scraping these sores with a broken piece of pottery. It's an image of total desolation. His clothing torn, sores all over, his head shaved, and he sits in a pile of ash. As you look at the imagery, as you think about it in your mind, you just think it's too much. It's too much, God. Stop, God, relent. How can you expect anyone to worship you when you allow this kind of suffering? How can a person trust your justice, your mercy, your compassion when something like this can happen to such a good person like Job? It's not right. It's not right, God, that Job would suffer like this. And it's in that place in this very moment when it evokes that type of response out of you and out of myself, that's right where the author of Job wants us to be, advocating for Job and questioning God's sense of justice and how the world works. The author wants us to be on Job's side, commiserating with him. 
And if it could just end there, I mean, haven't we seen enough? It, could it just end with the misery that Job has and with that great question? That's enough, right? That's, that's enough for us to experience on Job's behalf. He's held on this far. Verse 10, in all of this, Job did not sin with his lips, it says. Surely that's all he can endure. It's not over. The physical pain, yes, the physical pain is is done. Satan's not allowed to kill him and to cause more pain, inflict more harm upon him. But his children, yes, children are gone. There's nothing else that can be taken. His physical possession's gone. Nothing else can be taken But that wasn't it. That was the loss. That was the physical pain. All of this that's unfolded in the first two chapters. But the rest of the book of Job, 38 chapters follow after this. And it's not about the losses that Job has experienced, but mostly about the mental and emotional torment that Job goes through as his friends attempt to counsel him as to why these things have happened. It's the endurance that he has to hold on to as he hears advice from one after another about why it is that he's going through such a difficult time. As they try to make sense of this great tragedy of Job's life, and they, instead of consoling, bring accusation and after accusation into Job's life. This counsel of others that Job would hope he could gain understanding or at least they would console him in some way, but it's not meant to be for Job. (laughs) There's only more heartache out of the counsel of those who are supposed to care for him and care about him. And he doesn't even actually get to his friends before the first counsel comes his way. The first counsel comes from the person who's supposed to be closest to him, his wife. In verse 9 of chapter 2, she says this, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Hmm. Wow. What, What a way to experience the counsel of your spouse is when you're in your deepest spot, your lowest point of misery, and the counsel that you receive from the one closest to you is that she says, why are you holding on to your integrity? Just give it all up, curse God, and die. Here's Job's wife. In her own misery, her own devastation, she sees no hope, no life ahead, only the experience of grief and loss. Looking at her husband trying to hold on to God, he's struggling to hold on to his faith. She looks at him and she says, it's futile. It's ridiculous. Why are you trying to think that there's any meaning to the life that you're trying to hold on to? What good is it? Our life is in ruins. Put an end to it all. Curse God and die. Well, for this message, this is our first glimpse of bad counsel that comes to people who are in troubled times. And as you and I reflect on our lives in the moment in which we live in 2020 as this message is going out, there's so many people giving counsel, there's so many counselors, air quotes, who are out there giving all types of advice. And I wanna suggest some of it is really, really bad. really bad counsel and you should plug your ears and just say, I don't want to hear any of it. But we do look around, we say, what's good counsel? And the first bit of counsel that comes to Job and in the coming weeks, we'll be looking at other types of counsel. But this first type of counsel is the counsel of shared pain. It's the misery of another's loss joined with your own. It's the counsel that grows and grows out of the wounds of grief and loss. Job's wife isn't giving him sound biblical advice. She's giving him the counsel of a shared grief and a shared loss that only sees sees misery, only sees pain. The counsel of shared pain is what we give when we hurt. We the, the hurt of seeing another who's in pain or we ourselves are trying to empathize with them. 
but it moves beyond empathy or sympathy and it moves towards our justification of actions or their actions. It's one thing when I want to sympathize with somebody or let them understand or to hear their pain and I sit with them through that. It's another when I cross over the line and I share in that pain and I turn and identify myself with them and I sit and commiserate and I don't help them move forward out of it. I'm willing to justify my actions or their actions, whatever they may be. We give or receive this counsel when our friends take up our side of the story. So it's heard in words like this, I'm on your side. Whatever you wanna do, whatever you decide, I'm on your side. Or whatever you decide, you have my support. Now that sounds very empathetic or caring, but you know what, that's really not good counsel. When somebody's grieving, when somebody's in great loss, our counsel to them or the counsel we should receive isn't whatever we want to do is good and justified. It's counsel that says, good for you, Job, for being measured in your responses, for holding your tongue and not sinning against God with your lips in the midst of the most difficult of circumstances. Do you know when we're most vulnerable is when we've experienced great grief and loss. We're vulnerable to doing things that are completely unwise, of making decisions and choices, life decisions, rash statements that would come out of our mouth, out of grief and loss that we can't take back and have potential, the potential to alter the course of our life in severe and measurable ways and not always for the good. Here's Job's wife, her counsel in the midst of this, Job, curse God and die. That's not good counsel. That's commiserating with Job in a way. That's her saying, that's how I feel about it. So why don't you just do it so we can end all of this? Listen, real counsel, these types, it doesn't use these types of blanket statements. Real counsel is measured. This type of blanket statement, whatever you decide to do, I'm with you. No, no, no. If somebody tells you that, you say, I appreciate the support, but I don't need somebody who's gonna let me do whatever. I need somebody who's gonna help me think clearly in the midst of my grief and loss or my confusion. This is not helpful counsel just to go along with whatever somebody might want. It might be what feels good to tell them or it feels good to hear, but listen, we can do some dangerous things in our pain and feel justified for doing them, but it's not true that that's the way we should go. When you're in pain, Here's what you and I need to say. Here's what you or I need to hear. Hope and healing comes through God's restoration, not self-justification. Hope and healing comes through God's restoration, not our self-justification. Listen, I will do terrible things in my dire moments and feel justified for doing so. I'll make up a reason that I should go spend that thousand dollars I don't have. I'll make up a reason that I can go spend mindless time on the internet or in movies contributing nothing to helping me move forward. There's a reason that when I'm in grief and loss, I'll be tempted to say hurtful things out of anger or out of deep sorrow that then I can't take back, but I've wounded somebody else. Listen, what we need to hear, what we need to understand, and it's challenging, but in our desperate times, hope and healing comes through God's restoration, not through me being self-justifying my actions or speaking that type of uh, counsel to somebody else. There's a lot of well-meaning friends, family members in these times who will say, take matters into your own hands and live life on your terms. You don't have to experience this grief and loss. You don't, you don't have to feel the weight of it. The truth is, Every one of us goes through grief and loss. Every one of us has a Job experience. Now I pray to God that I don't ever go through the severity of hardship that Job went through. I pray you don't experience something like that. But the story is here for us to understand that when grief and loss comes, we need to, as Job did, guard our heart and our tongue and our actions in such a way that we can stay righteous before God because there's a lot of bad counsel that's going to come our way. And we need to look at the scriptures and understand where good counsel comes from. The type of counsel 
you and I should embrace as the kind that keeps us connected to God, not pulls us away from God. Now, throughout the month of September, these coming weeks, we're going to look at other counsel that Job received and how is it that we can avoid that type of counsel and how is it that we can follow Job in his pathway, understanding, oh, the roller coaster of emotions that Job experienced through this. And then we're going to finally end up at this point where we're going to hear God's counsel on the matter. Maybe not the solution, but we're going to hear God's perspective and wisdom as to what it is that Job's going through and why all of this is happening. And my prayer is that in the midst of this, what will happen is you and I will have more clarity for these times in which we live to live with more wisdom as to what our measured response and our, our righteous response to God is in the midst of troubling times. Instead of following these side trails of bad counsel, which begins with Job's wife, who says, do whatever you want, because God's not with you and it's not worth following him anyways, that we can avoid that type of counsel and we can stay close to God in troubling times. God has counsel and wisdom for you. And I believe we're going to see some of that unveiled in our reading of the book of Job. Well, thanks for following along with this morning's message and uh, I want to give you just a moment to get elements for communion and uh, as you do then we'll come back in just a moment to receive communion together. We come regularly around the communion table because Jesus is the one who instructed us. He said, do not uh, stay away from this table. He, he said he's not going to eat of the bread or drink of the cup until we're reunited again around the heavenly banquet table. But he said that for us, that we should do this regularly, that we should come together around our communion, our fellowship with Christ, and that we should be reminded that our gathering point of all the division that's in the world around us and even division that's come into the church, we need to be reminded that we gather around the bread and the cup, that we share a common master, a common savior, that we share a common table and a common union in Christ. And so as you hold the bread, let me pray that we would walk in unity one with another around our Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you for the bread. And we are reminded in this world where division is the norm, toxic speech is so common, accusation is thrown around, walls and divisions around political parties, or around racial issues, that division comes up so strongly. And yet, Lord, you have spoken a message of unity within you that the kingdom has come and that's where we gather around. That even when there is differing opinions and views about things, that we are never allowed to push aside others in the faith, that we're never allowed to create division within your church, your body, but that we always come back to the table and we're reminded that it's our love that is the witness to the world around us, our love for you and our love for one another. And so, Lord, we thank you for the bread. We remember your body, that you disciplined yourself enough to go to the cross, to die upon the cross, to be buried and resurrected and now seated at the right hand of the Father. We thank you for your body and we remember you and your atonement for us, that if you could lay down your life for us, that we too can lay down our pride and our lives for one another setting aside what we sometimes believe are irreconcilable differences, but the reality is, is that we've been reconciled in you. So Lord, draw us together in you, we ask. Amen. Receive the bread. Lord, this cup, we're reminded that you have forgiven us. And because you have forgiven us, there is no sin too great against us that we can't also forgive. 
we're reminded, Lord, that just as in Christ we have been forgiven, so too we should forgive one another. So we take a moment. Lord, if anybody comes to mind that needs our forgiveness, we don't receive this cup in an unworthy manner, hastily, not recognizing what it, you've done for us, but we practice reflection. We silence our thinking about other situations and we spend time to be with you to say, Lord, is there anybody that I need to forgive? Anybody that I need to ask for forgiveness from? May this cup remind me, Lord, to take action, to not be passive in receiving and extending forgiveness, but that which I would bind here on earth would be bound in heaven above. That which I would loose here on earth would be loosed in heaven above. So Lord, there's real power and authority in our extending forgiveness. We thank you for the cup. We remember your sacrifice to cover our sin and we receive it with your grace and mercy. We thank you for this cup of redemption. Amen. Receive the cup. As you go forward throughout this day, through this week, I encourage you, seek the counsel of the Lord. There's so many voices out there talking, so many opinions being thrown out there. But the one that matters most, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, is the opinion of God that we find in the word and the leading of the Holy Spirit as he opens up the scriptures to us. Don't allow yourself to give the counsel of whatever somebody wants to do that's justified. And if somebody's given that to you, I encourage you, listen to it and set it aside and say, I want to be tempered in my responses. I'm tempted to make a bad decision in my grief or loss or in the haste of the moment. The Holy Spirit will lead you. The Holy Spirit will guide your steps and give you the counsel you need through wise people, through the scripture, and through his own instruction in your life. So I pray the blessing of the counsel of the Holy Spirit upon you as you go throughout today, the rest of this week, and in the coming weeks after. You can find more resources for this service at nhgj.org. Email us your prayer requests to prayer at nh4gj.org. If you are a new follower of Jesus, we have a free resource for you called Following Jesus. To receive a copy, send a request to info at nh4gj.org. If you would like to partner with our ministry through giving, you can do that online at nhgj.org giving or by mail to 641 Horizon Drive, Grand Junction, Colorado, 81506. Thank you for being with us and may the Lord bless you.